Hello and welcome to Top Knot Education, where you get insight and summary into the chapter of a classic novel in under five minutes. Today we'll be talking about J.D. Salinger's Catcher in the Rye, Chapter 5. This one's going to be a little bit of a long one, so hopefully I can get it in under five. Chapter 5 begins with a discussion about steak. They serve steak every Wednesday at Pensy. Holden thinks it's a trick to make the school look good and insists that the steak is lumpy and tastes bad. This raises an interesting question about affluence and privilege. Holden is struggling, but does he have a right to? With real problems in the world, should we care about a whiny, rich, white kid who thinks the steak at his fancy private school isn't delicious enough? That's for the reader to decide, but I appreciate that Salinger, a semi-wealthy New Yorker, recognizes that Holden is at least partially blind to his own privilege. Following that damning detail, we get a demonstration of Holden's best qualities. For one, he's going to the movies with a guy named Mal Bursard, and he invites Ackley along. Here's the quote. I asked Mal if he minded if Ackley came along with us. The reason I asked was because Ackley never did anything on Saturday night except stay in his room and squeeze his pimples or something. Mal said he didn't mind, but that he wasn't too crazy about the idea. He didn't like Ackley much. Holden doesn't like Ackley much either, but he asks him because Holden is sensitive and empathetic to Ackley's own loneliness. He's reaching down the hierarchy to help lift Ackley up. This is something Stradladder would never do. We get a nice detail about Ackley when Holden asks him to come along. Ackley needs to know who else is going first. We can sense this is because Ackley always gets teased and it won't be fun for him if a jerk is going to be there too. Ackley is safe with Holden, but not too many others. For me, this is another detail that attests to the quality of Holden's character. He may not be as successful as Stradladder, but he's a hell of a lot kinder. Directly after that, Holden goes to the window and he sees the snow. Here's the quote, and it's an important one. I went over to my window and opened it and packed a snowball with my bare hands. The snow was very good for packing. I didn't throw it at anything, though. I started to throw it at a car that was parked across the street, but I changed my mind. The car looked so nice and white. Then I started to throw it at a hydrant, but that looked too nice and white, too. Finally, I didn't throw it at anything. All I did was close the window and walk around the room with the snowball, packing it harder. A little while later, I still had it with me when I and Broussard and Ackley got on the bus. The bus driver opened the doors and made me throw it out. I told him I wasn't going to chuck it at anybody, but he wouldn't believe me. People never believe you. Holton won't throw the snowball because he doesn't want to mess with the natural beauty of the world. We see the other characters storming around, taking action, and going on dates, but Holden is a different type. He's kind and sensitive and respectful in a way that has nothing to do with his homework or obeying his teachers. The bus driver doesn't understand this, of course. He thinks Holden is a quote-unquote normal kid and will cause havoc if he's allowed to keep the snowball. Holden doesn't want to cause havoc with the snowball. He's almost caring for it as he carries it around. They don't see the movie, but do play some pinball, then return to Pensy. Ackley wants to stay in Holden's room, lying about his sexual accomplishments and picking his pimples on Holden's pillow, but Holden kicks him out so he can do Stradladder's homework. The assignment is to write about something descriptive like a room or a house, but Holden decides to write about his younger brother Allie's baseball mitt. Allie had written poems all over his mitt, and he liked to sit in the baseball field and read the poems instead of playing the baseball game. Like Holden, Allie refused to play the game the way everyone else wanted him to. Unfortunately, Allie died of leukemia on July 18, 1946. Since names are important, we can consider pronouncing Allie's name as Ally. Holden was very close to his younger brother. Here's a quote recollecting how much Holden cared for Allie. You'd have liked him. He was two years younger than I was, but he was about 50 times as intelligent. He was terrifically intelligent. His teachers uh, were always writing letters to my mother, telling her what a pleasure it was to have a boy like Allie in their class. And they weren't just shooting the crap. They really meant it. But it wasn't just that he was the most intelligent member of the family, he was also the nicest in a lot of ways. He never got mad at anybody. People with red hair are supposed to get mad very easily, but Allie never did, and he had very red hair. I'll tell you what kind of red hair he had. I started playing golf when I was only 10 years old. I remember once the summer I was around 12, teeing off and all, and having a hunch that if I turned around, all of a sudden I'd see Allie. So I did, and sure enough, he was sitting on his bike outside the fence. There was this fence that went all the way around the course, and he was sitting there about 150 yards behind me watching me tee off. That's the kind of red hair he had. God, he was a nice kid, though. He used to laugh so hard at something he thought of at the dinner table that he just about fell off his chair. In his grief uh, at um, Allie's death, Holden broke all the windows in the garage the night Allie died, and his hand still hurts from the injury. It's not only his hand, either. We can see that Allie's death probably tore Holden and the rest of the Caulfields apart. 
Holden's parents were likely too sad and tired to deal with Holden's troublemaking, and they sent him to a series of boarding schools where he promptly got kicked out. The worst way to recover from losing a cherished family member is losing the rest of your family by being sent away. Still, that's what happened to Holden, and for the first time, we get a sense of the depths of his loneliness. When you're a teen and you read this book, you think it's about teen angst. As you get older, you start to realize it's about depression and overcoming grief. This detail puts the lumpy steak in perspective as well. Yes, Holden is rich and white and eats steak every week, but money and racial privilege can't protect him against death, and Holden is going through a very real struggle. It seems Ali might have been one of the few as nice, as sensitive, and as smart as Holden himself, and thus a true ally. Holden finishes the composition and lays in bed listening to Ackley's snoring. Ah, I went 45 seconds over. Sorry, guys. Get to class. <laughs>